As Mark said, our talk is called A Glimpse into Accessibility. My name is PJ Haggerty. Uh, I'm the founder of devrelate.io, uh, which is a developer relations as a service company. I also work at a company called Mattermost recently, and we're going to talk a little bit about accessibility today. So bear with me. The beginning part's going to go pretty fast. No, so I'm not gonna sign the whole talk. Um, if some of you know what ASL is, that's what I started this talk off with. And the point of starting the talk off with, in ASL is to give you a feeling what it's like to not have access to the information that you want or need. Signing, in this case, instead of speaking, was a barrier that prevented a lot of people in the audience from understanding the story that I was trying to tell. So let me start again from the top and first I'll introduce myself. My name is PJ Haggerty. I'm a senior developer advocate at Mattermost. I'm also the founder of devrelate.io and I'm on the board at osmihelp.org. Um, Mattermost, the people who pay me the most money, um, are is an on-prem secure chat ops uh, platform. It's all open source. You can build it the way you want it. It is free. There is an enterprise edition if you need more help. Um, community and team communication with safety and security in mind. To learn more, check out mattermost.com. But let's go back to the beginning of the actual talk. Why this talk? So part of this talk was inspired by these two people. This is Bill and Lena, my mother and father-in-law. Um, they met at the Deaf Olympics in the 1960s and it's a great story and I'm sure you'd all love to hear it, but this is neither the time nor the place. I'd be happy to answer those questions later. Um, that said, these are the two people that I think of most often when I'm designing software. And you might say, why? Why would you worry about a couple of septu septuagenarians who barely know how to hook up a camera to a USB port? Believe me, they're more savvy than that, but we have had many conversations about cameras, USB ports, USB-C, USB-2, USB-A, all of that at many family dinners and functions. But aren't we focused on the cutting edge? Shouldn't we be focusing on our groups of 16, 35 year olds, which are, are the largest consumer group when it comes to making technology? And the answer quite simply is no. This was the true beginning of this talk. Bill and Lena are my inspiration. But this is the beginning of this talk, and I want to make it clear before we go too far. I'm not here to sound holier than thou or like I'm super woke. The idea here is unless something has touched your life, you probably don't consider it in your day-to-day -day coding. Um, this screenshot is from a tweet from someone I really look up to, someone who I consider one of the best coders um, in the world, not only because of the high quality of code they produced and the success they've had over the years, but because of their consideration and their empathy in the way that they do things, the way they write code and the way that they live their lives, the way they're dedicated to diversity and inclusion, even if that's something they don't have to do because they are so successful, but they do it because they love what they do. It's from November um, of last year. Neither video chat nor deaf people using it for this purpose was new when this tweet came out. And yet this person who, again, very considerate person, an amazing person I consider a mentor, had never thought about it before because it wasn't a part of their life. Um, we like to think that we're like really used to understanding accessibility because of the everyday things we experience. But at the same time, like we can't even get the names right. Um, here's a discussion between two people, two developers, talking about captions. Note in these tweets the complete lack of the word captions. Subtitles are for people who speak a language other than the language in the video presented. For example, I know a lot of developers that like anime and a lot of anime is in Japanese and it will have English subtitles. Those are subtitles, not captions. Captions 
present a person with the words or a paraphrase of the words, especially when it comes to live captions, being spoken in the moment. They are not the same thing. Um, if you really want to get an understanding of how that works, watch a subtitled movie, a, a foreign film, film foreign to you, I should say, and watch it with subtitles on. Then watch a live sporting event with captions and see the difference. You'll see that the captions aren't catching exactly what's being said, but they try to convey the general idea. Unless it's like a really fast sporting event, like hockey or basketball, in which case sometimes they don't even get to the idea. They just go as fast as they possibly can. Um, names might not seem important, but vocabulary and communities where accessibility is an issue, issue is crucial. Here we have another example. Can anyone tell me, feel free to drop it in the chat. Can anyone tell me the difference between these two people and the job they are performing? And it might be tough because this is still a still image. But the woman on the left wearing the, the black outfit there next to the nurse in the flowered costume, she's an interpreter. An interpreter, yeah, you got it, Maurizio. An interpreter voices for a deaf person in a situation when they sign and signs the information the doctor or nurse is giving to the patient. Often they will not sign the exact words. The hearing person in the situation is using their voice to say the exact words, but the deaf person doesn't need, they need to get the idea. This is because ASL is not a direct correlation to spoken English. Uh, the order of words in ASL is very different. Um, for example, you know, we'll say, I'm going to the store. In ASL, it's, you know, store, go, me. That's the importance of the words in this situation. On the right, we have a translator. A translator takes the exact words and phrasing of a person using one language and uses it to discuss use it to construct and relay the information to another person in a second language. This task translates word for word whenever possible. There's a fine line between these two jobs, but calling them by the right name helps. It's super important. Um, if you'd like to know more about deaf culture, this whole talk isn't about deaf culture, but if you'd like to learn more about deaf culture in general, I recommend following, following a guy named Niall DeMarco on Twitter. Niall's deaf, he grew up in a deaf family and he advocates for the needs of deaf people worldwide. Um, you might already know who he is because he rose to fame as a model and then he had a run where I, I believe he won um, the American television program Dancing with the Stars. Um, he has a super positive outlook on everything he does and a ridiculous sense of humor. He's a really funny dude. Um, I highly recommend following him on Twitter, watch his videos. You'll learn a lot about deaf culture that you probably didn't know. And there's going to be some moments where you say, oops, I, I've done that. And sometimes your discomfort is, is all part of the learning process. So follow, follow Niall, see what you can learn. Um, but on to accessibility. We're here to talk about technology. This is a technology conference, all things open. We love technology. And there are some examples that we used earlier, like FaceTime, video chat, and caption. Those, those are excellent examples of assistive technology. All of them are more or less hardware-based, um, or in the case of interpreters, they're physically based in the real world. Um, the same is true, true of larger solutions like video relay services. Back in the day, deaf folks, if they needed to call someone, they needed to use a TTY. Uh, how many folks have used a TTY? Just feel, feel free to raise your hands and make me feel like we're all in the same room. Um, it was horribly slow. It relied on one at a time communication, taking turns. And if you needed to call a hearing person like the gas company or you wanted a pizza delivered, there was no guarantee of success. No guarantee whatsoever. Now it works a lot more smoothly in the fact that direct communication can be had. Um, but what's missing? Like what, when we build web and mobile applications, what are we forgetting about when we build things like video relay service? When we first started considering issues of accessibility, we were first concerned with blind or sight impaired users. Oddly, one of the easiest things in the world was alt text. It was a solution that wasn't built for screen readers, but when accessibility tools like JAWS came around, alt text was made so that like our image here, if an image doesn't show, a description would. So that was the original purpose of alt text. Luckily, screen readers picked up on this and it became slightly more common to see in use. Unfortunately, many modern languages, especially those that generate HTML dynamically, do not include alt text generators. These levels of abstraction have made it more difficult to have an accessible site or application. If you're wondering what languages I'm talking about, I'm talking about uh, some of the modern PHP frameworks like Cake. Uh, Ruby on Rails does it, will generate an empty alt tag, which isn't great. Um, a lot of the JavaScript languages won't bother to do anything at all. Um, you're, so you're, what you're giving up in ease of use and, and faster um, minimal viable product time, you're losing in the accessibility war. Um, so that's not such a great thing. Um, so there's some trips, tips to adding alt tags. The first being make it meaningful. 
So everybody close your eyes for a second. And I believe that you're doing this. I totally 100% trust in you, even though this is a virtual conference and I have no way of proving it's true. Close your eyes for a second. I'm going to describe to you something two times. So keep your eyes closed. The first description, here we go. A picture of the ocean. Okay. The second description, the ocean with rolling waves crashing over one another, the sun high overhead, a seagull in the distance hovering over the waves. One of those descriptions had value, the other did not. Adding a longer alt text that fully describes the picture adds value to the site or application. If you can't come up with descriptive text, ask yourself if that image is truly necessary. Um, also try to add value by, not, by avoiding words like graphic of, image of, diagram of in your alt text. That's not helpful to a screen reader. If you're dealing with someone who has never had sight, telling them that it's a picture of something they've never seen doesn't really help them at all. Um, this one seems like an easy one because it does make it easier for folks with no sight impairment, no sight impairment but label your form fields. Um, beyond the design aspect of it looking nice, labeling form fields is similar to add, adding alt text to images. It allows a screen reader to understand the information that needs to be entered and where. In this case, many modern languages allow this by default and the abstraction layers can be helpful. Um, why is that true for form fields and not images? We may never know. I think part of it is a design decision. Uh, they want the design to look good, but they're not considering the actual screen reader. It's just coincidental that this works out for them. Additionally, allowing any credit card fields to automatically default to the card being used instead of picking it or using a Dropbox to select the credit card type is extremely helpful and it's just good design in this day and age. There's no reason why you can't do it. PayPal has a whole set of tools for accepting transactions through a website. If you need to go and get their design help, go get their design, their design help. Beyond the design aspect, screen reader software can get hung up on things like Dropboxes and pick lists. Try to avoid them if you can. Here's another one that kind of goes along the same lines. Give button elements inner text, or if it absolutely must under any all circumstances be a graphic, label it properly with alt text that corresponds to what a textual button label would be. This is similar to the alt text issue and the form issue. Being descriptive makes it easier for the site and paired to grasp what it is they're, they're clicking on or what you want them to click on, what it is you want your user to do. Also, similar to the form elements, this benefits non-site impaired people as well. Some of the basic needs of accessibility fall over into just good design, good UX and UI strategies. And that's really what we want, right? We're trying to build a better application, build a better site for our users. If we're true to that, then these, these things should be falling in line. Radio buttons need labeling too. It's impossible to use the field set element in HTML to label a group of choices. I'm sorry, it's possible to use the, the field set element of HTML to label a group of choices. This can make it way easier to read radio buttons and make it way easier to, to label them. Um, same logic here, make it easy for people to understand what they're interacting with, understand what choice they are making and help them to understand this is a radio button, this is a single choice, um, which is an interesting thing because I know how radio buttons were described to me when I first started programming and I don't know if they're still described that way. Um, especially because I don't know how many people actually remember push button radios uh, that were in cars back in the 70s, 80s. That's where they got their name. That's another fun conversation we can have after the, after the talk. Um, fonts seem like an important thing because they are. These are super really important. Um, and I don't mean let's make everything Comic Sans. We should not make everything Comic Sans. It's a world we don't want to, none of us want to live in. Uh, fonts can affect though the way that people look at your site and application. Uh, generally, most sites work with Helvetica or Arial or some variation thereof. I know we all have our specialized font sets and, and custom made fonts specifically for our companies. That's great. Make sure that they're easy to read. Um, the, Arial and Helvetica make content easier to, digest, easier to digest, hence it becoming the default for so many frameworks. Fortunately, these are also fonts that are easier to reach and interact with, making it better for both the sight impaired, hard of hearing people, who need to read content and others. And when I say others, consider this. Oftentimes when you're using serifed fonts, even though it looks fancy and it's very pretty, people with dyslexia have a very difficult time understanding what those letters are trying to do. Dyslexia is the main reason to avoid serifed fonts, um, not just because it looks cool. 
Captioning, we mentioned this a little bit earlier, but it isn't always a simple, a simple process. There are so many services out there. Um, live captioning at tech events like, like ATO is becoming more and more popular, but also with the abstraction layers that we have on actual uh, presentations and things like that make it kind of difficult. Uh, you know, I know that at events I've done, we've done, um, yep, Maurizio, I saw your question. I will totally get to that. Um, but I know that at DevOps Days Buffalo, we used a thing called white coat captioning, did live captioning. It's a lot harder now that we're in the virtual world, believe it or not, it's actually more difficult. Things like Zoom and, and, uh, and other platforms don't have automatic captioning and it causes severe delays and problems and a lot of times doesn't come out very well. Um, but it is becoming more common to live caption things. Um, there's a lot of video out there for tutorials and how you do that on pages. Making caption doesn't only aid the heart of hearing, but it's also great for folks with dyslexia because a lot of times they follow written words better and it helps them with their dyslexia. Um, and it's not just, you know, think of it, you know, as reading instead of hearing the content. Some people just learn better that way. Um, let's see, now that I clicked on that chat. Um, when I first started looking at accessibility, one of the biggest blockers was JavaScript. Um, 10 years ago, if you wanted an accessible ADA, that's the American with Disabilities Act, compliant site, it meant cutting JavaScript down to as near to zero as you could get. These days, modern JavaScript can be made accessible. Um, every flavor of JavaScript has different protocols and some are more accessible than others. Uh, Node is getting better. Vue.js is really good with accessibility. Um, be aware of the pros and cons when you're adding JavaScript to a website. And listen, I get it, this is an open source conference and everybody loves JavaScript. And let's be honest, if you're working on the internet at all, you're working with JavaScript. We all have to do it, it's, you know, but maybe we don't have to do it in the vanilla sense or in the horrid jQuery sense, but there's JavaScript somewhere in your application. Try to make sure that wherever that JavaScript is, is working, wherever it's doing something, it's doing it in an accessible way. So the focus for many of the basics that we've seen so far has been on the site impaired. Um, since our media is the internet, it's essentially a visual media. So this has always been the case. That said, the visually impaired aren't always blind people. In the same way that hard of hearing doesn't mean 100% unable to hear. There are gradients to this thing. We need to be aware of all the things we need to code for. We need to be aware of our audience. Um, I, I use this picture as a great example. I am not, this is hard to tell because it's virtual. I am not a tall person. When I go to concerts, a lot of times, this is what I see. I see some people, they're definitely on stage. They're definitely playing music. I just wish I could see their faces, but chances are as soon as the arms go up, I'm not going to. That's life. I don't have access, full access to the stage. Um, YouTube is an excellent example of a visual medium. Most visually impaired folks will not head to YouTube for content. The site's too busy. It's ridiculously hard to navigate with something like JAWS or a screen reader. Um, YouTube is not in any way accessible. That's changed in recent months and they've added some features to make it easier to move around. Uh, but some of them, like you literally have to pay for YouTube, whatever was it, YouTube Red Now or YouTube TV, whatever they're calling it this week. Um, whatever I'm getting messages that I'm never gonna sign up for. Uh, but these things are hidden behind a paywall and that's not really fair. On the other side though, on the non-site pair, the captions are pretty good. They're not perfect or universal, but deaf and hard of hearing people love YouTube. Like in the past two or three years, it was like they've rediscovered it. Caption videos opened up a world for deaf and hard of hearing people that they had been blocked out of for a long time. Think of how long you've been using YouTube. Think of the first time you watched a YouTube video and think about only having that experience for the last two or three years because the captions were only really, really available for the past two or three years. They've been available longer, but they, don't, they didn't work properly until the last two or three years. Other video ser services like Netflix and Hulu, they're seeing value in it well. Uh, believe it or not, when Netflix first came out, you couldn't use captions at all. It wasn't worth it. Now that's all, you know, that's all my in-laws watch is Netflix. They love it. There's so many shows that they're rediscovering because they finally have captions to put to them. That's about knowing your audience. Um, Site is kind of important. It's basically how we use the internet. It's like I said, there's another category of blindness we need to be aware of. How many people can see the, the number in this image? I'm curious. If you can't see it, say something in the comments. Maurizio is on point. This guy knows how to use comments. Um, so the number is 74. 
Mike can't see it. The number is 74. It's in green and light green and yellowish green on a brown background. Um, color blindness, also known as color vision deficiency, affects approximately one in 12 men or 8% and one in 200 women in the world. No one knows why men are more affected than women. Uh, there's no clear reason that it's just a genetic thing. Um, there are different causes for color, color blindness and there's different types. Uh, red green color blindness can make images like this one difficult to see. Uh, if you thought you weren't colorblind and you cannot see that number, I highly re recommend you see an ophthalmologist. You might have a color blindness issue and it might be easily corrected with glasses, believe it or not. Um, it makes it important to look at your color scheme when you're considering building an application though. If you're dealing with colorblind people, you need to know that, right? Less of an accessibility, but more of a need to remember kind of thing is there's a whole world of mobile applications out there in the world. Allowing for pinch to zoom capabilities lets sight impaired folks pick out what they wanna read, what they're able to read and interact with. Um, I worked with a, a gentleman named Austin who, who was 100% blind. They, they consider him 100% blind. He had a guide. But with the accessibility features of the iPhone and the, the Mac OS ecosystem, he was 100% able to be a, a top-notch programmer. And he often built applications that worked better for blind people because that was his audience. That was knowing who he, who he dealt with. Um, additionally, mobile devices mean better access to the world in general. If we look at the example we used earlier, FaceTime, this is essentially a way to replace the TTY for daily use. My wife and her mother they communicate daily on FaceTime. And I'm gonna tell a little story here. My mother-in-law is from Sweden. Before the advent of mobile applications like FaceTime, her choices for communicating with her brother who continues to live in Stockholm from her home here in Buffalo, New York, were to write a letter and wait a couple weeks for it to reach him, send an email, which was okay, but not quite the same thing. Send a fax, come on, really? Can you imagine how much a fax from Buffalo to Sweden costs? And then wait for them to be, or, or wait for them to be in the same place, which was rare. Now they chat daily. She's been living here since the 1960s. She's been living here for 50 years apart from her brother. Only in the last five to 10 years has she been able to communicate with him on a daily basis. How crazy is that? And it's FaceTime and iMessage. These aren't complicated technologies, but the technology allowed them to communicate the same frequency as hearing people. It gave them access to something we've all had for so long. A tremendous breakthrough that only occurred in the last 10 years. So how do we check for these things? How can we ensure that an application is compliant or at least accessible? And should I have access to an audience with accessibility needs? Fun fact, you probably should have someone in your realm with accessibility needs. There should be someone on your staff, someone on the QA team, someone somewhere who has accessibility needs so that you can check. And before we look at these tools, let me say this is not an exhaustive list. Um, there are a lot of tools out there and there's a lot of experts out there that will tell you what they like. I always recommend the best fit for your team or organization. I will say these are tools that I have used in the past. Um, and that's why, you know, these aren't, this isn't an endorsement from, you know, PJ told me to use this. It's just a suggestion, just a, a place to get you started. You will find other things, I'm sure. Um, that said, let's take a look. Um, First thing is the accessibility accessibility engine or X. This tests out an HTML document to find potential issues with accessibility. Um, this tool gives you a score. So it lets you know how well you are complying with the ADA guidelines for accessibility. I believe at level one, which is kind of your minimum, like I have an accessible website. Um, there's level two and three and that's like, can I apply? my application to a government, you know, for a government contract or for university contracts or for education. And they have diff different accessibility needs depending on where, what, what your end user goal is. Um, there's browser extensions that integrate this in both Firefox and Chrome. And I believe Brave if you're into that scene. Um, and that'll help you to see what can be fixed and where. Uh, gives you a great report, gives you the score. It lets you know exactly where you need to make fixes. Um, Pally. P-A-11-Y, pronounced Pally, is another tool that can help bring attention to any accessibility issues an application might have. Uh, Pally is a script. You drop a URL in and it runs the check. So you, you then get a report and you can sort from there like what action you'd like to take. Again, this action is gonna be on you. There's nothing that you're gonna be able to run that's gonna fix everything in your application for you. You're going to have to kind of like figure that out for yourself. Um, JAWS is of course the tool that gets mentioned most often. Everybody's kind of aware of this one. Uh, for those who don't know, JAWS is an acronym, Job Access with Speech. It is the most commonly used screen reader available. 
It is thorough and it covers every accessibility issue that blind people might have when using the internet. Uh, JAWS, unlike the previous two tools, is not free, however. That said, there's a free uh, version. You can see it there uh, at the download, you know, under the download JAWS. You can get it. And I think it, it does most of what JAWS does. It will give you a good impression of how it works. It'll help you to understand what you need to do and what needs to happen. Um, it, will, it will give you the experience of what JAWS is like for an end user. And that's really what you're looking for. If you plan on doing extensive research, I highly recommend paying for JAWS. For testing things like colorblindness, TopTal has an excellent uh, filter that allows you to enter a URL and then see what it looks like for people who have colorblindness. I've done this with my own websites, both uh, impj.xyz and devrelate.io. Uh, with devrelate.io, it led to us completely revamping our site um, because it was clear that through, it, through a colorblind reader, you couldn't read half the content, uh, which was crazy. Um, this is key. Like It really clarifies how much the issue affects colorblind users. It is super, super awesome. Um, it also, I mean, in general, beyond the whole application development things, it, it helps you to understand a little bit of what your users might go through. And colorblindness, like, I mean, 8% of men, that's not a super uncommon number. Like if you start crunching numbers out of 7, 7 billion people, 8, 8%, what's 8% of 7 billion? Ready, go, okay. Who's, who's the first to answer? I will give you a crisp high five when next we meet with elbows or something. I don't know what we're doing after COVID, but it's a significant number of people. That's what I'm trying to say. So, I mean, just take a look, take a, a drop a website in. It's uh, toptal.com slash designers slash color filter. Color filter is all one word. Take a look and just see what your site looks like. It, it will be um, unintended pun an eye opener. Nothing beats testing with real people that have access accessibility issues. Having representation in this process often makes the difference between having a complete application that meets the expectations of the users and missing a few key things because we don't think like people who need accessibility applications. This is simpler than it seems. Uh, we've all heard the story, I assume we've all heard the story, but I'll say it again, of the issue with facial recognition software. And I'm not talking about the political issue or the whole big brother issue or anything like that. I'm specifically talking about um, the issue with the fact that it doesn't read non-white faces. Uh, make sure your team is not exclusively white people. Look at that, you fixed an accessibility issue. Make sure the team that tests your software is not exclusively white dudes with beards. Look at that, we've solved an accessibility issue um, and we've maybe made the world a better place. Otherwise, you might have problems. Uh, working on a new video, video application, find some deaf students in your area, high school students, colleagues, interns, whatever, and have them grade the level of captioning accuracy after they've read a transcript. A direct transcript is word for word, exactly what people need to hear, um, but maybe they can't, or maybe reading is easier for them. So the deaf person reads the transcript, then they watch the video and they see how much it matches up. It's an interesting experience. Students love doing this. Deaf people love to help other people understand accessibility issues for deaf people. You can easily do this. Um, diversity isn't just about the teams we work with. It's also about the people using our applications. This is key to what we do. Um, we, I know we hear a lot about diversity and inclusion. That has to include our end users. It needs to. It's a must. There's no way we can get around it. Remember, as we start to wrap up, always use alt text on every image. Label your form fields. Caption all your videos. Default to the sound being off. That's just good practice. If you have a video that automatically plays when someone goes on your website, very not well kept secret in the world of, of web development. Everyone hates your website. Um, radio choices need, need labels too. Mind your fonts, know your audience, use the tools you know and are used by end users. Remember, there are so many groups that wanna access the applications that we're building. We need to break out of the idea that accessibility is for a limited group of people. It's for everyone. Everyone needs to have access. And we need to think of everyone when we build the future. And that's what we're doing, right? We're building our future with web applications. Um, if we can give all of our users a better experience, why wouldn't we do that? We've looked at ways to make things more accessible, many of which do not add significantly to our application development cycle. It will at first, there'll be an initial bump as you start to integrate tools and things like that. But once you make it part of what you do on a regular basis, it will make things better. And these things will make our applications 
tremendously better for this minor, minor amount of effort. With a few easy steps, we can make the web and mobile worlds better places for everybody. And isn't that really our goal? Isn't that what we're trying to do? With that, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my information is on the screen. Um, I know there's QA. Let me see what the questions are. Uh, recommend a plug in your website that will grade your website on accessibility. Mercy, I think I got that one. Um, when is alt text too long? So there, that's an interesting question, actually. There's, if you're getting into paragraphs and things, if you're getting to anything beyond a sentence of description, chances are um, you are going to have problems. It's going to be just way too long. Um, try to keep it to about a sentence, two sentences if you absolutely have to. If you're getting into something that's more descriptive than a sentence or two, maybe look at what you're, what you're presenting and wondering why it's such a complicated thing and why you need to present that to people. Um, what are some federal, local, or nonprofit organizations that we should network with? Uh, basically, if you look up uh, hashtag A11Y, you will find lots of organizations. There's there's an international um, international accessibility organization. I will tweet it out after this talk because I can't remember the URL for it exactly, but they're great people to get in touch with and they're happy to help you with finding resources. Um, checking non-public sites, e.g. internal behind a firewall. Um, if you download the, Claire, if you download PALI, the P-A-11-Y um, script, you could do that directly on your machine. You can do that locally. So you should be able to do that behind a firewall. It shouldn't be a problem. Um, let's see, I answered that question. This is a pretty cool thing here. You can mark off what questions I asked. Um, we answered that. I'm gonna answer that on Twitter. Cool. Ashley, are Sarah's fonts the only ones to avoid or fancy fonts should be avoided in general? I, I, I would avoid fancy fonts in general. Um, I am not great at design. You can't see this, but I'm wearing a t-shirt and jeans because that's about as fancy as I get. Um, really, I, I think that the, the, the more simple you keep the font, the reason why Helvetica is such a widely used font is because it's sans serif and it's easy to understand. And that's why it's everywhere. It's like every street you drive down in all of the US is using a Helvetica font in some way, shape or form um, or Hel Helvetica base. So fancy font, fonts should be avoided if they can, if you can avoid them. I know that there's some design people disagree with me on that. What is the significance of the 11 in the name? So 11, because between the A and the Y in accessibility, there are 11 letters. That was an easy one. Nailed it. Good question there, Rebecca. A lot of people don't ever ask that question. Um, what are accessibility concerns to consider for things like tables and graphs on a web page or on mobile? Uh, tables and graphs should be, graphs you can treat pretty much like images. Tables are really hard to navigate. If you can avoid table layout, that would be a wonderful thing. Um, but yeah, I think that's, I think that's all I have time for. Oh wait, sometimes I feel like visual design fails, falls to the wayside uh, to be WCAG and ADA compliant. Do you have an example of super designerly websites uh, that are WCAG and ADA compliant? I don't off the top of my head, but I can find some for you, anonymous attendee. Um, if you send a, just DM me on Twitter, it's at Esplenic. Um, and I will find some examples for you. Um, my good friend, Adrian Roselli, who is very big in the accessibility world, um, has a whole list of these resources that should be, should be easy for you to find and follow. And I think that's all the questions. I got all the questions done. Yay. Um, Mark, are you still around? Oh, oh yeah. I, there's one more question. Don't forget the importance of links being properly informative. No click ears. Yes. Exactly. I mentioned that in the beginning of the talk. No click here, no submit. Make sure that your buttons and your links say exactly what they're supposed to do. Excellent point. Thank you, anonymous attendee. All right. When you say tables are bad, do you mean specifically table or CSS based layouts? Yeah, a CSS based layout that looks like a table, Claire, is totally fine as long as there's no, think of it this way if you turn grid lines on, is it going to prevent someone from seeing it? Um, my suggestion, if you're using a CSS based layout that looks like tables, run it through JAWS and see what JAWS says about it. Um, if it's reading it like a table layout, then probably you need to find another solution or maybe a different CSS solution. Um, but yeah, if, if you're using a, an actual table, that's, that's probably horrible. Um, 
but yes, yeah, my suggestion is always run it through JAWS. Some CSS based layouts that look like tables will run through JAWS exactly like you were using the table tag. Um, others will look at it like it's well separated and very good looking content. All right, I hope everybody enjoyed that. Um, I hope not anybody left because I signed the first five minutes of that, uh, which can be off-putting. I know it's a little scary sometimes, um, but that was to give you a little glimpse into what accessibility should look like. So if that's all the questions, I'm gonna stop sharing because uh, I think the next speaker is here because it says speaker and then speaker and speaker. Oh, it's okay, PJ. You still have about 10 minutes. So oh, I do. You can still go. Yeah. So if anybody has any more questions about accessibility, feel free to tweet at me. Um, this is a very complex issue. It's, you know, this, this talk is meant to give you an idea or a starting point. Um, it's not meant to be the end all be all. Like, I, I'm sorry, but you cannot all go back to your bosses and be like, yo, I know everything about accessibility. Now, PJ said I do. Here's his email. Please complain to him. Please, please don't do that. Um, it's, it's totally not rad when you do that. Um, but yeah, like it's uh, it's 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 totally totally cool. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, I'm glad you enjoyed the ASL. My ASL, fun fact, you can't tell because most of you don't know, is not great. Um, I used to be fluent. I am now slightly less than fluent. If I brought my wife in to the office here, you'd be blown away at how different the two things that that have occurred would be said. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I highly recommend learning at least some ASL. Uh, I've had lots of conferences where I've been communicating with the deaf attendees all to myself. Like I can say whatever I want about the whole community because no one else can sign. Um, we don't want people to feel left out. So learn a little ASL and it'll do, it'll do you some good. And it's, it's okay that the next speakers are here extra early. That makes, that that's awesome to me. <laughs> no, really, sh feel free to turn your cameras on. We could have a, we could have a full transition here. Um, oh, cool, more questions. Uh, let's see, Claire, any recommended places to point developers to show what's in their hands? I don't know what you mean by that. What's in their hands? Like what capabilities they have or? Claire, if you could follow up and, okay. Not just picking colors for color, color line. Yeah, so um, like there's lots of places they can go to understand that um, this talk I think is being recorded. Mark, is that right? Um, but this is a, you know, this is a. Yes, that's correct. It's being recorded. So yeah, so feel free to share this talk so they understand it's not just colorblindness. Um, generally take a look, you know, anytime you see the hashtag A11Y stuff, share it with other developers so that they understand like th there's a huge responsibility that we have. It's really important that we ensure that our websites are accessible. Um, will the slides be available? Yes, uh, I will put them up on Slideo or slide deck or somewhere. I, I will tweet it out. So if you follow me on Twitter, you'll definitely find out about that after, after the, uh, after the conference. Um, do you, do you, do you know of any accessibility regulations that federal or state agencies must follow? Yes. I know that, um, some of the simple things that we talked about Maurizio, like, uh, alt tags, um, and having alternative sites, alternative, alternative navigation, on sites for, for the sight impaired and for JAWS readers is a bare minimum ADA level one, I think, um, requirement that if you are coding for a, uh, at, the, at the federal level, definitely state agencies, they change. It kind of depends on where you are. Most of them expect you to be level one compliant though. But also if you, if you enter into a contract with them, you have a certain amount of time to get ADA compliant, even though that's been around for a while. Um, do I have any learning? resource for learning ASL. I do. Um, there's a great thing called ASL Pro, um, and you can go and start learning words there. There are plenty of lessons online uh, on YouTube, actually, to get you started. There's also a Twitter thing called ASL Sign of the Day um, that will teach you some things. And you're going to start simple things like thank you, um, hello, 
boy, girl, things like that, you know, things that are simple and straightforward um, and build up on that. It's just like any other language, practice, 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 practice. Um, it's hard to find out what's required for each business. How do you know what level you need to be for private web store owners? Ashley, that's a great question. Um, with businesses, it's kind of dependent upon their, their desire. Um, businesses, for the most part, unless they're engaged in like selling to, to government type actors, um, are not required to be accessible, unfortunately. Um, this is something that, that I've run into several times with websites that cannot be accessed in any way, shape or form um, by site readers and things like that. And it's, it's sad and it's terrible. Um, but unfortunately, there's not much we can do about it uh, until there's some sort of regulation put in place to say that all businesses must have accessible web stores or web fronts or, or whatever we want to call them. Um, I will say this, people who are using Shopify are getting a great deal because Shopify has a lot of focus on accessibility. Um, it's not required. They do it because they think it's good for, good for the community um, and the right, quite frankly. Um, but yeah, there's no, to my knowledge, there's no specific regulations around a, a business and what level they need to be compliant for a private web store. No problem. I gotta tell you, Mark, these people are so polite. They say, thank you uh, at, for all the questions. Like that's so great. Oh yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. <laughs>